think life is simple. Mm-hmm. And, and I did not say easy. I do not believe life is easy. I believe life is simple. Mm-hmm. And if I had to boil it down to one simple equation, and you may take exception with this, okay? But think about it before you argue mm-hmm. the other side. <laughs> Very few people ever have a problem getting what they really want from life. And it's about the same as the people who really decide what they want in life. All right, welcome to the Sales Wolf Podcast number 62. I am Joseph Caldwell, one of your hosts. Tyler Harris. And we have a special guest, Roger Ezell, and we are the Sales Wolves. All right, so uh, welcome to the podcast. We're excited today. We have a special guest. And uh, Tyler, you want to tell people why we do this podcast before we introduce our special guest and talk about him? Absolutely. We do this podcast for two reasons. The first uh, is to show support and appreciation for salespeople. Uh, And if you don't realize it, uh, you are a salesperson. No matter what your profession is, you're either selling yourself to someone or selling yourself to do something uh, every single day. And and we know that sales is a lonely road at times, and we just want to show appreciation and support for those that are out there doing it. Um, The second is to provide some actual tactical things that you can take, implement, and will improve your business and your life. So uh, support and appreciation, and then actual tactical skills and uh, things that you can implement that'll make a big difference. So that is why we do what we do, and we are 62 episodes in, and it's getting better every time. It's getting better every time. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so best this is i'm so excited about this podcast because we have roger ezell with us and you've probably heard me mention him or mention my mentor or when i say something about um, something i've learned in the past from somebody i'm typically referring to him and you've heard me mention his name and so we really wanted him to come on here and and everybody to get a to get a chance to learn from him you can learn from your experience which costs you or you can learn from someone else's experience, which cost them. And uh, and so I have learned a lot from listening to him and from the experiences he's had in life. And so I'm excited to have you on here, man. Thank you for coming on our podcast. Thank you, I appreciate uh, you. If you want to tell everybody what you do and, and, uh, and man, let's, I want you to tell your story and just how you got to where you are and Tell us, talk to us. He's well, an old, he's an OG sales wolf, I can tell you that. Well, I got my start in life selling pots and pans. We went out and knocked on doors, sold pots and pans. I never Love sold it. anything and uh, loved business and uh, hired a lot of salespeople and mm-hmm. trained them to do that and later got into financing. And now I'm in the car business and uh, we have 10 buy here, pay here car lots in upstate Love South it. Carolina. It's all about the team. We got a fantastic team of people. Yep. And that's why I can be here because I've got a great team of people back there. Uh, awesome. Sales, each of us succeeds in life to the extent of our ability to sell. Our sales, our ideas, I've never ever wavered from that Say that belief. again, each of us succeeds in life to the extent of to our the- ability to sell our ideas, our beliefs, our products, hmm. our way of life. And uh, all of us sell for this. every single day. <laughs> And if you're not selling, then you're working for somebody that's selling. I can guarantee you that. True. And um, I believe in the sales business because nothing happens until somebody sells something. That's right. And I haven't even said this to you, but I I will tell you that uh, the opportunity that Consolidated is providing for people Mm -hmm. is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, The money that can be earned by being one of your associates is beyond belief. But more importantly, what they will learn and what they will become if they take advantage of everything that you're offering is worth more than any diploma. Mm -hmm. I see a diploma up there on the wall. That's Tyler's worthless diploma. And and I promise you, (laughs) I would rather have the experience Mm -hmm. I got in one year of selling pots and pans and all the diplomas I've seen. And that's pretty much my story. And it's all about building a great team 
of uh, people mm -hmm. who believe in the same goals and the same direction. I love it. I love it. Tyler, you got some questions you had, right? Yeah, I'll just start with the first one. I, I love to ask people, what's one thing looking back that you quit doing that enabled you to succeed? A lot of people want to talk about all the things that you did, but what's one thing that you stopped doing or quit doing that helped you to succeed? I stopped believing in failure and stopped and started believing in failing. A failing is a wonderful thing because mm -hmm. you can learn from a failing, but I've never had a failure. I failed at things, but even when you're failing, you're still a success because you're learning about life. A failure is someone who gives up. Mm. I love that. There was a there was a quote I think Gary Vee put out the other day, and it was it was profound in that it said it was something to do with winners or like the key to success is like it said something like. It was super profound. Huh? Like loving, it's like loving your losses. Something like like when you when you grow mm. to love to lose, that's how you win. Like you 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 welcome the opportunity to lose because you know that number one you were trying something mm -hmm. uh, that you've never done before, and number two there was obviously a lesson that came out of it. But it's those that actually like seek failures or failings. Seek failing, seek failing, seek failing that, that are the ones that ultimately accomplish a, the most. It's a stepping stone of everything. Yeah. I have years of it. Yeah. <laughs> years of it. Oh, yeah. oh man. I, I remember the first time I lost a million dollars one, in one day, and somebody said, my, how does it feel to lose a million dollars? I said, well, I never thought I'd be in a position to lose a million. <laughs> it didn't feel good, but I tried to look at it the right way. Yeah, yeah. Perspective is everything. <laughs> Man, and uh, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I have just been down in the dumps, or I thought, man, I can't believe this has happened to me. Um, and then all I needed was a perspective change. Um, one thing I was gonna, I was gonna mention, and it's cool because Joseph's obviously a huge, been a huge mentor of mine, and then to have you, that's been such a huge in, mentor of, of his. And I feel like, number one, there's a lot of stuff that you're about to be called out on as your quotes. That may, may not I, stole, I tell you, I steal everything. Because <laughs> that's what always happens to me. They're like, wait a second, he said that. Um, now you're going to say something so in a minute. I've heard. You're going to say something in a minute, and Roger's going to blank. I think <laughs> I, I said that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the coolest things that I heard you, I was, I was, we had a meeting in the conference room, and I was on by speakerphone when you came in one day, and, and we're talking, uh, and you talked about um, that quote, when one door opens, or when one door closes, another one opens. But it's um, hell the, in the, the hallway. The way that you finished that, I wanted to talk about that yeah. real quick, because that, that, I think, for a lot of people, that's where they're at, uh, yeah. is they're in that hallway. A lot of people live in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying as many doors as they can, as fast as they can. Well, I, I think uh, most people are familiar with the term, you know, when one door closes, another door opens. Mm -hmm. But the part that I liked the most was, it's hell in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get stuck in the hallway, like That's you right. just said, but you've got to do something to get out of the hallway and move forward. Yep. And we all have those uh, down times in life, and we all have times when we think, golly, how did, what did I do to deserve this? But it, I did learn one thing a long, long time ago. Pity parties usually only have one attendee. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I'm not fond of those kind of parties. So, right. you know, you got to move forward and, we all have those ups and downs. Yeah, when you say it's hell in the hallway, I've just got this mental picture in my mind. And you say you have to do something to get out. Literally, there's people that are in those situations in life right now. They're in the hallway, but there are doors up and down both sides of the hallway. Mm -hmm. And the only way they can get through it is to move, yep. move, try this one, hit the, one. knock on this door, open, try this door, try this door. And I mean, I went through years of doing that. I mean, you, you saw me go through years of doing that um, until we hit, until a door opened. And uh, so... It's just should be on this side of it because you, it's very easy for us to look at someone in the hallway that's staring at a door and be like, what are you doing? We're like, I'm just waiting for the door to open. And we're like, well, have you tried the doorknob? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you do know that has a knob there. I mean, there is a way to, oh, it's not going to open itself. Uh, but I think one thing that we've talked about recently is this idea that the opportunity of a lifetime and you know what someone's meant to do and all these things yeah. that are gonna somehow find someone. 
Does anybody believe that? <laughs> Apparently, because uh, that's apparently. The, because that's what so many people say that are just sitting around waiting. They're like, "Oh well, as soon as I find what I'm supposed to be doing, as soon as I can find someone, I can something I can become passionate about, then I'll go all in. Then I'll actually put the work in." You know what? They're gonna they're gonna write a tale one day, and it's gonna be on their deathbed, and they're gonna write all the stuff I wish I had done. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd. They will live an I wish I'd life. Well, it reminds me of the conversation I had with Jeff before we walked in here. And uh, I was joking and kidding and having fun with him about choices. Mm -hmm. And every day we wake up with a choice. And we can choose what kind of day we're going to have. I sent my son a text this morning. I put, life is great when we make it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. I tell my wife, my wife, when we first got together, she'd say, well, I have to go to work today. And so finally I looked at her one day and said, no, you don't. (laughs) She said, well, I have to go to work. I said, no, you don't have to go to work. She said, yes, I do have to go to work. I said, no, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. And I believe that everything in life is a choice except Mm -hmm. death. And we do, we can choose to hasten that, obviously. We can choose to prolong that, but we always have a choice. You know, each person in this room chose to get up and be here this morning. We didn't have to be here. So once you emotionally accept life is all about choices, it's really easier. It's not more difficult. No, nope. it's a choice. You know, and I had a choice this morning to get up, have a great attitude, come over here, and have a great time with a great group of people. Mm-hmm. That's the way I looked at it. Mm-hmm. But some people get up and instead of saying "Good morning, God," it's "Good God, it's morning." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is funny. There's a guy that stopped by Friday, um, and he's giving a TEDx talk. Their TEDx is doing um, one of their events in Greenville on f- this Friday, um, and his whole concept is the art of the conversation. And he's incredible. Like the first time I ever met with him and talked to him, I was like, that was one of the best conversations I've ever had. And then come to find out that's his whole deal. It's the art of the conversation. But he talked about this idea of every room that he goes into, every person that he sits in front of, every group that he's speaking in front of, he sets the temperature. He's like, I set the temperature. I don't, I don't let other people's environments, what they brought into that meeting. I don't let them affect me. I set the temperature and I create the environment Mm -hmm. that I want to have happen, um, like a thermostat, basically. Sure. Um, But I thought that was so interesting how he was like, I I will choose in this, whether it's one-on-one or whether, I mean, he's speaking in front of big groups, but he's like, I I create that environment. I don't allow um, that environment to create the the scenario and for how choice. I have to react. Yeah, that's it's one hundred percent choice, um, which is which is important. Uh, one one question that I did have on here that I wanted to ask you: um, What's one misconception that people may have had uh, of you that you could set straight? <laughs> that's very easy, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I can use Joseph as an example of that. Okay, uh, a lot of people look at Joseph and say. Well, no wonder he's got a great attitude. Look at the money he makes. Look Mm -hmm. at his life. He's got a great life. Mm -hmm. Anybody that has all that would have a great attitude. Mm -hmm. They have it backwards. The attitude has to come first. Mm -hmm. Then the money comes. And then Mm -hmm. the good things come. But most people go through life in reverse. They they sit in front of the stove of life and say, give me some heat, then I'll add the wood. (laughs) You know, you got to put the wood in first. Yeah, but Joseph had the attitude. He put the wood in. He paid the price, and then he's enjoying the rewards of success. So I think a lot of people look at successful people and they look at them backwards. What's That's it? What's true. it like a thirty or forty year overnight success? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a stellar student. <laughs> right? I crammed four years of college into five. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm a genius from the word go. So the. <laughs> I know you've got some incredible stories, but one that I'd love to bring up is we we always talk about how every successful person has a painful story. It's just whether we've heard it or not. But True. every every successful person has got pain in their past. Uh, and the part that we always add on to that is, will your painful story have a successful ending? That's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, but for you, could you maybe go into one of those stories for you? Maybe it was... Um, yeah, I know you've told stories about going to all the different banks and getting loans restructured after things happened and different things well, that, 1988, that happened. Isn't that when everything went south? The 1986 Tax Simplification Act 
that wrecked the savings and loan industry in this country that most people don't remember. But that's what happened. It didn't really hit the Lady Eight, but you're right. Yeah, everybody loves Ronald Reagan, and I was talking about him one day, and Roger was like, you know, I wasn't such a fan. <laughs> he, he was a great president, but he was. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, but you were telling me about that. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe that's the story, or maybe there's another story of just pain that now you see as happening for you and not to you. Uh, absolutely. Um, I was very heavily invested in very leveraged real estate. And the 1986 Tax Simplification Act caused a lot of problems in the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of savings and loans went out of business. And I went down to First Federal of South Carolina and sat down with Lee Alexander. And I said, look, I'm not in trouble, but it would be nice if you could do this and restructure my loans and really help me out if you, if you can, I understand. And so he called me back and he said, uh, I got everything worked out, I want you to come in. And I made an appointment. He took me down the hall and he introduced me to Joe Hudson. And mm -hmm. Joe Hudson was in charge of restructuring all my loans. And that's how I met Joe Hudson. Mm -hmm. And then one day at lunch, Joe Hudson and I were talking and I looked at him and I said, uh, how much money do you make? Joe, Joe knows I ask these questions, you know, <laughs> that totally disarm some people. But Absolutely. And uh, he said, he you told me. You ever been asked that before? He I have. <laughs> when? First words out of his mouth to me <laughs> and uh anyway joe told me how much money he made and i said uh well you don't make enough money and uh he said uh, what do you think i ought to do and i said i don't know let me think about it and in my mind i was going to think about it a couple of weeks and call him back and mm -hmm. at the end of the meal i looked at him and i said you know i said uh you're a great people person you got all sorts of people skills mm -hmm. you love cars you ought to go into the car business well i was not in the car business and uh that was all I said to him. So mm -hmm. he called me and talked and called me and talked. And I said, why don't you go down and meet a couple of these car dealers? At the time, I was financing mm -hmm. other car dealers. So I took him down and introduced them to Kerry and Billy Bolt and Bob Cochran. Oh, yeah. So he calls me back. He says, I'm going to take a week off of uh, work. I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to go work at this car lot. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't give it a lot of thought, you know. So then he calls me up and he says, I got two questions. I said, okay. He says, uh, where are we going to have our car lot and when can I turn my notice into the bank? <laughs> so just the fact that all that happened ended up creating Uncle hmm. Joe's and Family Auto. Wow. Yep. So and that was time, your first one, right? Yeah, that Uncle was Joe's was the very first one we opened. Yep. Hmm. Neither one of us had any clue of how to do it or what hmm. we were doing, but we had that double D formula that J.C. Penney always talked about, desire and determination. Mm -hmm. Those are two things you cannot give people. They have to have desire and determination on their own. But that's, that's a, what happened to me. Yeah. So what were some of the things that you went through when, when that whole crash took pl place and you were over leveraged and somebody had to restructure your loans? What did you do? Because I thought, I thought I remembered you telling me you had to actually move. You moved into your office. You, yep. So what, are, what were some of those things, and what was the work ethic like, and what, how did you see yourself getting out of it? I just decided that I was never going to give up. I was advised to file bankruptcy, and morally I just couldn't handle that, and I just said, I'm not going to do it. I said, I'm going to pay everybody. I paid everybody every penny I owed them. I kept my credit intact. I really don't know how, but I did. I was driving a... Uh, at the time, I remember driving a 12-year-old diesel car that I had to plug in at night so it would crank in the morning. And, <laughs> really? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm being serious. <laughs> and 12 years old then, so that was a 1970. Oh, well, it was, um, I, I remember in 93, I was still driving that car. So and, in 81. Uh, and then uh, it was an 81 Mercedes. And, but it would not crank unless you plugged it in at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, uh, but just don't give up, you know. Uh, Winston Churchill said it best, never, yeah. never, never give up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but everybody has those times in life, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. I just think most people refuse. To, they try to find, they look at that as happening to them, and they try to find a way around them. They're they looking try to for, find the comfort around They're them. looking for the blame certificate. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So yeah. they can blame someone else. Absolutely. Over. Instead of just walking through it. Yeah and continuing to lay the hammer down. Well, which... it's almost like even when you're in that situation, if so many people, they, they read all these books and all these biographies and they're listening to podcasts like this and they, they, they're taking all this stuff in, but when it comes to actually living it out, it seems like, like in that situation, 
if someone's in it, like they're in the mess right now, they're stuck. Yep. For them to just know, hey, I've read a hundred books about people that they were stuck too, and they just worked hard, and it was because of the situation that had them stuck that propelled them into this situation yeah. that they had this great right. success. But it's like that that disconnect of, oh yeah, I've read a hundred books about that. Maybe, maybe I, I should, should do yeah, it. Maybe I should just like it's. But when you're in it, when you're in that mess, it's like how to get someone to understand it r really that's in it, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's easy. I mean, obviously it's easier in hindsight, um, but it's so much encouragement to be able to tell someone and for them to actually grasp that notion of, Hey, what you're going through right now sucks. I'm not saying it doesn't, but do you realize because of what you're going through right now, it is going to be equal, if not greater, the success that you're going to have in the future. If you handle this right, right now, right. <laughs> And, and whatever that challenge is, whatever that obstacle is, whatever that situation is, there are the seeds of greatness floating in that atmosphere right there. Absolutely. They're right there. And if you could go, like, I want to, people that call me or people that send me messages on Facebook and stuff, mm -hmm. like, you don't understand the situation I'm in. I want to send them a message back and be like, congratulations. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> You're right there. If yeah. you just open your eyes and plow through, man, something, I promise you, you're going to come in contact with somebody. You're going to see the Joe Hudson. You had no idea. You were in the finance nope. world. You had no idea that you were going to meet the Joe Hudson. And because of that, that meeting and restructuring all your loans, you were going to find the thing that you're going to do. Exactly. And, and I'll tell you a quick story about a mentor, Bill Alexander. Uh, was a great friend of mine, and he's the one who taught me the answer is always yes subject too, by the way. I love that. But Bill Explain Alexander. That. Explain that so people understand. Well, people, people are always asked questions like, well, would you do so-and-so? You know, uh, For example, uh, he had an apartment complex mm -hmm. in central South Carolina, and uh, he was trying to sell this apartment complex, and he asked somebody, he said, would, would you be interested in buying this apartment complex? And uh, the guy said no. And Bill Alexander looked at me and said, never say no. The answer is always yes, subject to. Always. So he brought this apartment complex to this meeting for years, this investor real estate meeting I went mm -hmm. to. And so I noticed the price started at a million two and it had started coming down. And this particular day he got down to under $800,000 and that hmm. got my attention. And he said, would anybody be interested in uh, buying this apart apartment complex? And I said, yes. And uh, he said, well, what questions do you have? I said, would you be willing to finance it? He said, yes. And I said, well, I'll buy it subject to inspection. He said, when can you go look at it? And I said, when can you go look at it? He said, right now. I said, let's go. <laughs> and uh, we drove over to central South Carolina and we bought a, a three partners and I bought a 78 unit apartment complex. We went to the closing and got a check. Did you hear that? <laughs> we got a check when we went to the closing. How that was, is that possible? That was the deal I structured. And they said, he'll never take that. And years later, we sold that apartment complex, and I went back to Bill Alexander, and I said, I want to tell you how much money we made on this thing. And we actually made over $400,000. Okay. And he looked at me and he said, I am so happy to hear that. He said, I would have hated for you guys to have bought that thing and not come out well. And that's the kind of winner he was. See, yeah. that is the kind. Yeah. I love that. But he always told the, the one thing I remember, though, that Bill Alexander told me, and he had a way of knowing when I was down, he would call me and take me to lunch. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me one day and he said, you know, he said, everybody gets down. He said, but you know, if you're gonna go down, go down scratching, clawing, fighting, and swinging. <laughs> and I'll never forget him saying that. And I said, you're right. He said, have you ever seen anybody go down doing that? Mm -mm. <laughs> I said, no, sir. He said, you know what they do? They go, well, I can't do anything else. That's the people that go down. That's the people that go down. That's right. <laughs> what a guy. He told me that. That's incredible. Is he still around? Nope. He uh, died many, many years ago and uh, just an incredible guy. That's awesome. Um, I was talking to Tyler about that. That reminds me of something. I was talking to Tyler about something the other day. And a lot of people that have had some success in business, they'll, they'll say something like they're self-made or they're, they, 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 uh, 
the you know that whole self-made thing i i don't know that i can ever get that arrogant <laughs> like i'm not self-made because of what you just said like you he made he told you things Absolutely. you took things from him and mm -hmm. then you implemented them in your own life so that's literally like he's still living through you yeah you know what i'm saying and and i have a bunch of people like that a bunch of books like that and you being one of those people even when you probably will never die but even when, <laughs> even when or if that ever happens i'll still be able to say look at look at this part of my life i can directly track that back to a time when i listened and I got something I didn't have. So self-made, I just don't believe in it. You have to be on an island by yourself. Yep. <laughs> With no internet. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, most people don't know that Napoleon Hill filed bankruptcy three times. Did he really? Yeah, I didn't know he that. He was in uh, the book, Think and Grow Rich. Everybody knows the book, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Guess how much money he got out of that book? Zero. Yep. Why? I just guessed. His ex-wife got all the royalties from it. Wow. Read up on it. It's an incredible wow. story. But is that a positive guy, though? You know why? Because she read it first, and she was thinking <laughs> and growing rich. And, and, you know, most people don't know this. Napoleon Hill lived on Paris Mountain in Greenville, South Carolina. I, yeah. Did you know that? Uh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, he sure did. I saw him checking his mail one day. Uh, I was up there. <laughs> Never forget it. I wish I'd had the guts to stop and talk to him, but God, I did yes. <laughs> and uh, I was did riding you? along there, and a, a friend of mine was driving, and he said, Napoleon Hill lives up here. And I laughed. I said, what a joke. And he said, there he is checking his mail, and sure enough, <laughs> there was Napoleon Hill out checking his mail. Unbelievable! Yeah. Did but, you ever um, did you ever read his last book that was released like in two thousand eleven? Oh, yeah. um, it was one that stayed in the vaults and they wouldn't release it. I remember outwitting yeah. the devil or something like that. I did read. It's it. a fascinating yes, read. Yes. It's yeah. you know how he interviewed what twenty five hundred what he interviewed 2,500 failures and 500 successes or something like that. And and that's how he wrote his wrote his stuff. And, and he didn't get paid. And didn't get paid to do it. That's right. Yeah. But uh, but this is him interviewing, you yeah. know, what he said was Satan. So yeah. it was fascinating. I did, I did read that. I forgot about it. It's been a while. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. It's a fascinating read. But um, that one they wouldn't release. Did you know about that one? Mm -hmm. uh, you need to. You the need publishers to, were afraid to release it, I believe. Yep. It and his it. wife asked him. <laughs> Okay. His wife asked him not to release it, and they just kept it in the vault until until wow. finally 2011. The foundation allowed it to be published. It was interesting. He's a fascinating character. Who are some of the other people? Like some of your all-time best go-to uh, people, like Napoleon Hill books uh, or or seminars or. I like. I listened a lot to Zig Ziglar and mm -hmm. uh, Zig's brother uh, Horace or Judge Ziegler, as he called himself, I used to uh, pay him to come up and speak to our salespeople. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Zig was charging $5,000, and his brother, Horace, who lived in North Augusta, South Carolina, charged $500. Huh. So there was a choice. You know, yeah. He chose Judge, <laughs> and he sounded, looked just like Zig. It was incredible. You could wow. sit there and close your eyes, and you'd swear Zig was up there at the, at the head of the room. but. Uh, Unbelievable. But my, one of my great mentors, though, was James Burnett. He didn't mm -hmm. write any books, but he was a POW. And if you really want to read a, it sounds terrible, a great obituary, read this guy's obituary because he lived an incredible life. Wow. He died. I met him. Thanks, yeah. Thanksgiving Day, he was 94 when he died. Wow. wow. Had prostate cancer over 25 years earlier. Nothing would whip this guy. I'm telling you, he was uh, incredible, but... <laughs> He told me that when he was 18 years old, he would call Walter Montgomery's secretary. Walter Montgomery was the head of Spartan Mills. Okay. And he would make an appointment with Walter Montgomery. Now picture an 18 year old kid going in to see Walter Montgomery. Right, right. And I said, well, what did you talk to him about? He said, I got business advice. And he said, uh, I would go see him and talk about my business plans. And I said, uh, did he always have time for you? He said, always. I said, did you spend a lot of time with him? He said, yeah. And I said, did you ever ask him if anybody else came to see him? He said, yeah. He, I said, did he? He said, no. Nope. And I, I thought, and, uh, but he was just a dynamo. I mean, just Love a it. great guy. And that's what people don't understand mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that I have found, and I have met some jerks or whatever, but I've met jerks that are poor too mm -hmm. and hadn't done anything. But, uh, but most successful people want 
to answer Absolutely. those questions and give back and, and to be able to pass information on. It's uh, it, it, I know I do. I know if somebody asks me questions, I'm like, I would love to tell you the answer. Yeah. And I'll tell them what I don't know either. I'm like, you might want to ask somebody else that question. Sure. I ain't figured that side out yet. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Well, it's just interesting that you too. would think the ones, the ones that you think have the least time are the ones that are probably the most willing to provide that time. Because, to invest that time. Yeah. Yeah, because everything's an investment at that level. It's mm -hmm. whether I'm going to invest my mind or whether I'm going to invest my thoughts or whether I'm going to invest my time. It's all an investment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fascinating. And James taught me uh, one very important fact that since you're bringing this up, he used to say, I don't understand why people who need help and people who could use help won't ask for help from people who could help them. <laughs> yeah. And he told me, he was always saying that, and uh, I, I carried that one step farther. Everybody needs help. Everybody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> true. we all need help. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, it's always amazed me that people who have financial problems will go and find someone to talk to their uh, about their financial yeah. problems who are worse off financially than they are. <laughs> you know, go see a rich person. Yeah. You know, ask go them. ask somebody that has yeah. some wherewithal yeah. about them. And say, uh, I got, I'm having this problem. What do you think I need to do? But don't be afraid to ask for help. And yeah. That's probably if I had to pick one thing that my employees and associates make the biggest mistake about is I hear this constantly. Well, I didn't want to call you because I know you're so busy. God, I hear that. And, and you know what I tell them? I'm not that busy because I got all you great people out here. I got such a great team. I got time to talk to you. Yep. Call me. Yep. Leave a voicemail. I'll call you back. Mm -hmm. Yep. I feel the exact same you way. I always a lot have of times. time to talk to anybody that will call me. Yep. That's awesome. So I know what, you've always called me back and yeah. every because I I call you and leave you a message. So, what's some advice on? getting a mentor and creating that mentor relationship because i know so many people are looking that's one of the biggest questions i always get like how do i find a mentor how do i find a mentor um, and i know a lot of it is organic it just happens um, but if someone is out there wanting to find someone that can bestow you know these things uh, on them what's the best way i know they need to provide value you know to that person it doesn't need to just be a one-sided deal but but how do you how do you do that? How have you how have you done that? How have you done that um, in in creating those mentor type relationships? Because I know you've had a ton. Um, I, that's for me. I just found people that were where I wanted to be, mm -hmm. and then I wouldn't leave them alone. <laughs> I, seriously, yeah. I, I I didn't provide shit to him in the beginning. Like oh, there wasn't sure anything. <laughs> yeah, but I was. It was one sided. <laughs> the job brought a great it. attitude to the table. Yeah. 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 You know, what price do you put on a great attitude? Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then it'll surprise you how many people will ask you questions and then do the exact damn opposite of what you tell them. Yeah. Hell, I've done that with Roger before. He's he told me <laughs> he has told me, you know. <laughs> I asked him about buying the house I'm in living in now. <laughs> and he was like, well, let me tell you from my experience. And he just told me all these stories that I should have garnered the lesson from. And and I didn't. We, we love our place and we live in the place. But I should have learned from him that it wasn't going to double my overhead like I thought. It was going to quadruple it, which is what he was telling me. But I was like, nah, what does he know? <laughs> well, he's on big houses. You know, so that's that's one where I didn't listen, right? And and so for me, it's people that ask me the question and then and then if I answer the question and I know the answer to that, are they listen? Do they actually implement something? Or do or or were they just looking for me to go? Because they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. Are they just looking for validation? Mm -hmm. But what do you think, Roger? How did you get your mentors? Ask and it shall be given. Seek mm -hmm. and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Most people are afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. yep. Ask, ask, ask. What's the worst thing that would happen? Somebody might say, no. <laughs> did that hurt? Nope. No. Just, you get lots of no's. Yeah. You know, uh, in the sales business, if you don't get at least, it, it, you get, you got to go through a lot of no's to get to a yes. And most people give up after when, how many no's? One. One no. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't even hear one no. I don't even hear one no. Mm -mm. That means they want to know more. You got to ask. <laughs> you, know, you just got to keep asking and asking and asking. Uh, my favorite example of that is, you know, I wouldn't be married 
You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the story. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I became single, and uh, I decided I was going to, this time, look for a, a lady the right way. I was going to look for a lady that had all the things I wanted. And... Uh, so I would prospect. I would send out on Match.com yep. 20 emails or 20 things a day, or whatever you call those things you sent out. It's been so long. And I would get a response. Because it's a game of numbers. It's a game Everything of numbers. It's a game, it's a game of, of numbers. numbers. With, yeah. So, you know, I found this. I, I skipped, by the way, ladies out there, I skipped all the women with glamour photos because <laughs> I knew I wouldn't want to be with them. Yeah. And I actually had a psychologist to tell me one time that women like that were too absorbed in themselves and their looks to ever pay you any attention. That's not so, what you want. Good advice. Anyway, yep. I finally found this woman, <laughs> and it was a regular photo, and I sent her an email, and it said, you're from Spartanburg. I'm from Spartanburg. You look like a happy person. I'm looking for a happy person. Let's have coffee. And she was so impressed that she immediately emailed me back and said, thank you for the invitation. I don't think we'd be a good match. <laughs> <laughs> and that was game on. <laughs> that, was, that was a no. Yeah. So I emailed her back and I said, I didn't ask for a lifetime commitment. I just asked to have coffee. Let's have coffee. And then when she met me, she proceeded to tell me all the things about me she didn't like. <laughs> We're married. <laughs> so, but my point is, most people give up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's easy to give up. And you guys are one of the best, most well-suited couples I've ever seen. Well, thank you. Uh, it's incredible. And she puts up with me, and that's a big job. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. So after that first that first date, where did it go from there? Uh, did you sell her on a second date? Or? Well, when we met for coffee, and she told me all the reasons it wouldn't be a good match, uh, I texted her after the meeting and I put, I never did get to buy you coffee, so we need to get together for coffee. <laughs> and uh, so then we actually had dinner one night and uh, it went so well, it was incredible. And from there, it was just the smoothest thing in the world. You know, we yeah. just we just get along. It's, I love it. But uh, She is so funny. We were telling a story earlier because Miria is from Greece. For the Cyprus. island, Cyprus, Cyprus, a Greek island, Greek island, yeah, Cyprus, and so um, she'll mess, she'll mess like sayings up and words up sometimes, <laughs> which is the funniest thing on the face of this planet. And so, so she was talking about Jeff Mag's wife after Kim and I did our thing at Folly Beach where we got remarried yeah. and all yeah. that stuff. And Roger and Miriam were down there, and they were talking to Jeff and Sarah. And Miriam was talking about just how you know, because she's because Sarah's Malaysian, mm -hmm. and she Miriam was headed back talking about just how much she liked Jeff and couldn't remember Sarah's name. <laughs> and she goes, you know, that girl, that girl from malaria. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm riding down the road, and I go, what? <laughs> but I'll, with, with her accent, I always say that living with her is a daily exciting lesson in listening. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's funny. It is good. Man. So do you have any other uh, words of wisdom on your paper there? Because I know you had a couple of things um, you wanted to mention. I think life is simple. Mm -hmm. and, and I did not say easy. I do not believe life is easy. I believe life is simple. Mm -hmm. And if I had to boil it down to one simple equation, and you may take exception with this, okay? But think about it before you argue mm -hmm. the other side. <laughs> Very few people ever have a problem getting what they really want from life. And it's about the same as the people who really decide what they want in life. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask the average person, what's your goal? What's your, what do you want to accomplish in life? I want to be happy. Be happy. I want to be successful. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, so most people never clearly define exactly what they want in life and put it on paper. Mm. That's why I say very few people ever have a problem getting what they want if they clearly define it. Roger used to start meetings, and you probably still do, um, with a sentence he would say, are your goals clearly defined and written down? What was the phrase? Clearly defined and written down. That's how you would start. Specific. Specific. Have to be. Specifics alone give us a directional compass to life. 
Most people will go through life being a wandering generality and never be a meaningful specific. Say that again. <laughs> I don't know if I can. It sounded good, though, didn't it? <laughs> I stole that from Cabot Robert, by the way. Yeah. You have to be uh, a meaningful specific. Most people, really, their goals are wandering generalities. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be successful. I want to be happy. I want to uh, make a lot. I want to make a lot of money. What, what's that? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Jerry Richardson, a lot of money. You know, he's a billionaire. George Dean's a billionaire. Yeah. You know, so they wouldn't consider being a millionaire a lot of money, would they? No. So no, that's they not, it yesterday. That's not clearly defined. It, it's true. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. When you talk about clearly defining, because, I mean, there's so many people, and myself, that in this process of trying to figure out what that looks like long term, mm -hmm. when you're clearly defining, is it clearly defining just how you want your life to be like, or is it as, as specific as what you're doing on a daily basis? Or like, what does that mean to you when you say clearly defining? Well, it's hard to, money is one thing you can measure. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's pretty mm -hmm. simple. Yeah. I've never, you know, I used to have this little exercise where I'd get a deposit slip and show it to people and say, can you show me where there's a place on that deposit slip for happiness? Yeah. Can you show me a place for goodwill? How about blue sky? You know, there's there's currency, coins, and checks. So on a tax return, we put how much money we made a year. I think yeah. that's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. It's not embarrassing to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. is it? Nope. So, you know, and for some people, it might be $40,000 a year. For some people, it might be $4 million. But you've got to decide how much money you want to earn. You notice I said earn mm -hmm. per year. The only people who make money work at the Bureau of Printing and Engraving or the Mint. The rest of us have to earn money. That's right. So you have to provide a service and you have to be of value or provide a product to earn money. So you decide how far above this so-called plateau of success that you want to aim for. Yep. And it's personal for everyone. You'll find that once you do that, your personal life will probably fall into place. Yep. And you can set aside time to go to Ireland, yeah. and you can set aside time to have a renewal of your wedding vows. Money, as Jeff Albrook says, gives you choices. Mm -hmm. Choices are good. It's a fact. Yeah. I don't know if so, I answered your question. No, you did. to clearly yeah. define the dollar amount yeah. that you want. Yeah. So people, but people don't typically determine the dollar amount. And then what they what they really don't do is determine what they're going to have to give up or what they're going to have to give to get it. Mm -hmm. Like they won't get specific. And I remember Roger pushing. He's the first one that handed me a a, a printed copy of a million dollar bill, and had me staple. It's not staple it. Had me tape it to the desk. So every day, man, it was right there. I mean, I'm sitting at this desk. I'm going. Oh, I'm gonna make a million dollars a year. I'm gonna make a million dollars a year. And I said it so much. And even when we weren't working together, it's that stuck until it happened. And it's just that's that's uh, it was clearly defined. Um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating how that works. Yeah. Wandering generality. Well, when you when you define when you define what that number is, being able to reverse engineer that, and as far as how how in the world you're going to get to it, and I think the important thing in that is, let's just say I love using that number eight hundred seventy six thousand because it's a hundred dollars an hour, twenty four hours a day, three hundred sixty five. And being able to place that value on your time, to where if you're doing something today that's not worth a hundred dollars an hour, and that's the person you want to be, then it's figuring out, okay, how do I either delegate this to somebody else? How do I make this more efficient? That way it doesn't take as much time. Or is it something that needs to be done at all? If it's not based on what I'm valuing my time at. And I think that's something that people obviously are wasting a tremendous amount of time, but beyond just the simplicity of wasting time, there's such a huge gap in what they're saying the value of their time is worth and what they're showing the value of their time is worth. If you're doing something that you could pay someone $30 to do it and you're saying yours is $100 an hour in your value, then there's a $70 gap there. The reality is for most people, it's way more than that probably. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that that's an important concept of not just the value of your time currently, but going ahead and valuing your time in what you want it to be sure. worth mm -hmm. uh, one day. It's just a, it puts a different perspective on things um, that I think is important. 
And if you're going to kill time, why not work it to death? <laughs> That's that is good. <laughs> uh, was that on there? <laughs> no, I just thought of that one. <laughs> what else you got on there, man? I love. I, I pull so much out of out of when you're talking and learn so much. Well, I think I think I covered most of what I had written down there. But uh, uh, you know, uh, I sent my youngest son to text this morning, and I put this is what I sent him. I put life is great when we make it that way. Yep. It's, it, and it's a decision every morning when you get up. You can have a great day or you can have a bad day. It's a choice. Yep. It is always a choice every single time. Oh, and, where's uh, Maitland? That's Tyler's wife. <laughs> and my daughter. Oh, is she here? Yeah. She, yeah, she looks yeah. enough like him to be her sister. Oh, there she <laughs> is. Yeah, I know they look a lot alike, don't they? <laughs> I, I, that's why I looked up there. I thought it was Kim at first. You want to come be on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> that's true it is about choices everything's about choices but you, you talked about the value uh, Earl Nightingale says when you ride around during the day and you ride through the community look at all the riches look at all the abundance mm -hmm. out there aren't you just as deserving of that as any living creature that's right. And I, I've always remembered Earl saying that. It was just an yeah. incredible thought. You know, why not? You know? Yeah. Well, when you grow up, you grew up fairly poor, right? We were so poor, we couldn't afford to pay attention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you grow up that poor, a lot of times you grow up with the mentality that it's not for you. That that's for other people that were born into something different or that they're better than you. And did you ever face that or did you that ever was, have to overcome that? Was that? Drum, that was drummed into you, but I'm going to throw that back. I'm going to throw the ball back. At what age did you know you were different? And at what age did you know you were going to grow up and be successful? Uh, as long as I can remember. Yeah. See, as every long as success, I can remember. Man. Every successful person I've ever asked that question had either that answer or they were four, five, or six. It had to be that age. Yeah. I remember yeah. saying, I remember telling my mom and dad that I was going to be so rich that when rich people found out about it, I didn't know the difference between rich and wealth, but I said I was going to be so so rich or so wealthy that when rich people found out about it, they'd get sick about it. <laughs> That's what I used to say. That was my, that was my thing. I, and they were like, how are you going to do it? And I was like, hell, I have no idea. <laughs> and I remember uh, my mother and my grandmother when I was growing up, and I remember the age because I remember where I was living. Mm -hmm. I was probably around six, and I remember constantly hearing, "Well, you can't have everything you want." Hmm. And I used to think, "Why not?" Yeah. I, I, as a young kid, I mm -hmm. thought that why not, you know? And I, I just always felt like I was a little different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too, for sure. I think that's that's probably the best way we can kind of close the podcast is talking about that idea. I think it's. One of the most important concepts that you mentioned is just abundance and just that that feeling of abundance, like versus scarcity. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the one of the it's one of the most important things that people need to get a grasp on is this idea that there's not if, uh, one pie and that the piece that you get is now a piece that I can't get. Mm -mm. And that's what I think gets back to why we do this podcast. I want um, you to have the whole pie. You yeah. want to know why? Because I'll make another damn pie. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, well, because it's, it's infinite. We'll open a pie factory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's the important thing about, like we talked about mentors uh, that are willing to invest their time in others. And this podcast that we're willing to spend our time sure. um, investing in, in other people so that they can be successful. And the idea that there's no secrets. There's no, you know, this is something that I got to hold close because I figured out this sales tactic. Like there's none of that ever. Yeah, yeah. Like within our business, but within mm. any business, the person that thinks that way has that scarcity mindset versus I've met versus with so many, abundant. And, and I learned this from Roger. I remember calling him. The whole reason we have anything here is because I called him one day and I was talking to him on the phone about our about our system and how we sold insurance. And I was like, Roger, nobody does it like this. And this is what we're doing and this is the success that me and Jeff and Nathan are having. And 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 I said, I 
I am trying to hire other people, but I'm scared somebody's going to take this system mm -hmm. and they're going to they're going to steal it and use it across you. And he just laughed. Mm -hmm. He thought that was the funniest thing he ever heard. He said, "Boy, don't you know thieves don't work as hard as you're working?" Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he said, "You ain't got to worry about that." He yeah. said, "Just go and do it." And that literally was the six months prior to our first training course. That's when we went from 2,500 policies in 2012 to 9,000 in 2013. Mm -hmm. And it was that reason alone where I just, I literally took that day, drank some vodka and let go. <laughs> I just let go of that, that, that And it hasn't been a problem. It hasn't been a problem, yeah. no. In fact, when insurance people call, I remember, I remember people calling you and you telling them how to do really good in the finance and buy here, pay here world. And I was thinking, what if they put a lot across the street? Right. I asked him that, and he said, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. I went, yeah. what? And, and may, so, I, may I mention one other quick thing I think is important because there's some doubters out there, mm -hmm. not, a, not of Joseph, but they're doubters of themselves. Right. Forget about talent. Mm -hmm. Forget about ability. Mm -hmm. The world is full of able, talented derelicts and alcoholics. Yep. You give me a person with desire determination and dedication, I will always give you a winner every time. Uh, but those are the people that make it. They That's just right. refuse to give up. They do not understand. And my mentor, James, I told you he died at 94. He said, I've been knocked down so many times you can't imagine it. He said, but I got up every time. Every time. <laughs> and those are the winners. You got to get up. They're the ones that make it. Yeah. That's get out right. of the hallway. Yeah, it's <laughs> hell in the hallway. <laughs> I'm glad you remembered that. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, what was the advice you gave us? I said, hey, give everybody some advice here. You were on the phone or did you? No, you, he, he stopped by. You were on the phone. This, yeah, yeah. And it just popped into my head. Buy low, sell high, collect early, and pay late. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, There's some truth in that. Though. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you so you much for, for being me. on. It's an honor. I and, mean that. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. So yeah. hopefully uh, hopefully we can do this again and, and continue the trend. But uh, right. if people listen to what you say, I'm telling you, it's changed everything about my whole life, just paying attention and listening to the words of wisdom you would drop. And then it's not just listening because people go, people go, yeah, I heard that. What's well, different between hearing something and knowing something? You can hear something, but knowing it is actually putting action behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's something that I've done probably a uh, probably good seventy percent of the times you've said stuff, <laughs> and the other times I've learned from my own experience why I should have yeah, listened. You ought to have under your picture: act as though it were impossible to fail, because yeah. that's what you personify. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's impossible to fail. It's impossible. Yeah, that's good. Well, man, this is episode 62. 62. 62 of the Sales Wolves podcast. We hope you got something out of it today. If you didn't, this probably ain't the podcast for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but go subscribe to our YouTube channel anyway. <laughs> but uh, we have Roger Ezell with us today. My name is Joseph Caldwell. I'm Tyler Harris. And we are the Sales Wolves. Oh! Oh!